In life, we all encounter obstacles, and those obstacles come in all different shapes, sizes, and forms. The question is, how do we handle those obstacles? Do we attack them head on, or do we allow them to make us quit? Welcome to the No Quit Living Podcast, where we aim to motivate and inspire listeners to never give up on themselves, their dreams, or their goals. We will interview successful people from all walks of life as they share their no quit stories when they had the choice to give up or give in, but they didn't. We thank you for listening, and we hope to be that jolt of positivity as you go for your greatness. Welcome to episode number 165 of the No Quit Living Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher J. Worth, and today's theme of the day is always learning. Our quote of the day comes to us from Robert Kiyosaki. Successful people ask questions. They seek new teachers. They are always learning. Today's episode is sponsored by the good people over at West Fair Communications, who publish the Westchester County Business Journal and the Fairfield County Business Journal. These newspapers do a wonderful job in covering all aspects of the business world within two of the most influential markets in the New York metropolitan area. You can also take advantage of their daily news feeds, which keep track on the companies and thought leaders in these important regions. For more information, take a look at www.westfaironline.com. Trust me, once you start reading, you won't quit. It's a complete honor to bring you today's episode. As a former NCAA college coach and former NCAA athlete, I'm always looking to learn from others. On today's episode, Kevin Eastman shares some insight not only from his life, his professional career as an NBA championship coach, but more importantly, as a lifelong learner. As our interview was done via video, Kevin not only delivered, but he also practiced what he preached as he took notes throughout our conversation. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Kevin, I'd like to welcome you to the No Quit Living podcast. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm actually looking forward to it because I, you know, I I really believe in in what you're trying to get done and the message you're trying to send. I appreciate it. And uh, I really, really appreciate you taking some time because I know you have some exciting news with with your new book out, which we'll jump into in a minute. But the first question I ask everybody is, are you ready to make it happen today? Well, every day I wake up. Uh, I'm hoping uh, that I can make it happen because I think when we wake up, we can, a good friend of mine is a guy by the name of George Raveling, who in my world, the basketball world is extremely well known, extremely well uh, respected. And he often says we have two choices when we wake up, we can make it a great day or we can make it a really great day. So I've always kept that in front of mind. Uh, so uh, part of my definition of a great day is, is trying to make things happen, uh, not just for what I'm doing, but hopefully I might be able to help somebody else too. No, I love that. And one of the questions that I ask myself at night is if I've helped or had an impact on somebody else's life and, and it doesn't happen every single day, but it happens more often than not. And for me, it's really important because I believe in paying it forward. It's something that we often talk about on our show. Mm, yeah. You know, I think... Uh, you know, whether you talk about success or you talk about leadership or you talk about coaching, um, you know, we often hear the word influence. And I, to me, that's number three on my list of, uh, of eyes. And number one and two uh, is impact. Am I impacting someone? And am I inspiring someone? So uh, for me, uh, the influence part uh, isn't as quite as important as the word that you first used uh, in, in this question, and that was the word impact. So uh, I'm like you. I hope I can impact. I hope it can inspire. And along the way, if there needs to be some influence, uh, I'll try and exert that uh, if I feel it can help someone. No, I love that. So before we went live, one of the things we talked about is that the number one objective of our show is to motivate, inspire listeners to never give up. And typically, I ask our guests if they have their own no-quit story where they could have given up or given in, but they didn't. I wanted to just put a different spin on it to you, and knowing that you are and have a very successful coaching career, I was wondering if you could maybe share one of the best or maybe your favorite no-quit story during your career. Uh, Probably when I came out of the womb is when I first started. (laughs) Uh, For some reason, I have a gene in there. Uh, you know, I get down sometimes just like everybody else does. Uh, I get embarrassed sometimes. I make mistakes as well. Um, but my big thing is no matter what the story is, that, that we just keep one word uh, front of mind at all times, and that's the word try. Uh, let's just try to do something uh, before we talk ourselves into 
uh, not being able to do it. You know, you, you, you've been in the coaching world, so you know sometimes you can lose the game in the locker room before the game starts by your mindset. So in terms of a no quit, gosh, you asked tough questions early in this thing. Um, <laughs> maybe it was um, probably in my coaching career. Uh, you know, we've all had speeches in our speaking career where we're like, they paid me for that piece of junk that I just spewed out of my mouth. So those are some days where you got to come back and say, ah, it was just like a bad game one night. You got to come back the next day and give a great speech. But in the coaching world, in my professional world of, of coaching, um, we were going on year four, I think, at Washington State. And we had one in year one, one in year two. Uh, year three, we took a little dip. Year four, we took another little dip. And I started to really evaluate, uh, is this really, first of all, am I good for Washington State University basketball? That was number one. And number two, uh, was I still loving what I was doing? So anyway, the, the athletic director and I sat down and uh, long story short, we came to the conclusion that I was going to step down. And uh, maybe that can turn a coach's ears red. Uh, maybe it can sting uh, him or her a little bit. Uh, but at some point, uh, like Pat Riley, the great coach of, of the New York Knicks, Los Angeles Lakers, the Miami Heat, he often said about coaching, uh, uh, you know, we know that we're, we're hired to be fired. We just don't know when. So it's going to happen to you. So instead of being fired, I, I made the choice to just go ahead and step aside. So I could have kind of quit then because all I had known up to that point, really professionally, was coaching. And uh, what I decided to do was take everything I learned in coaching and try and apply it elsewhere. The first thing I did was to get into uh, skill development camps, which got me an opportunity to work uh, and consult for Nike. And then Nike ultimately got me the opportunity to coach in the NBA. And then coaching in the NBA gave me the great good fortune of winning an NBA title in 2008. And then that gave me my first opportunity to really give a, 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 a speech uh, to a group, to a company. So um, had I quit, uh, I wouldn't be here on this uh, podcast with you today. Had I quit, uh, I wouldn't have... Uh, uh, the good feeling each and every day that when I wake up, I have an opportunity to help somebody else reach their dreams that they've set as a little kid and maybe, I don't know, fulfill the goals they've set as an adult. So my no quit was, yeah, it didn't work. And yes, it's, it's you know, in coaching, we're in the public eye. So that got in the papers. Uh, people were aware of it. Uh, but I decided that, uh, you know, that's a setback. Uh, and, and I was just actually doing a blog on Teron Liu, who got let go uh, the other day with the Cavaliers. And the, the gist of the blog ties a good friend of mine. We coach together in Boston and Los Angeles. And the gist of that is, uh, you know, something like that, a situation, a circumstance like that, it, it doesn't, it, it's not who you are. That's just what happened to you at that point. And then you have to make a decision. It is who you are if you keep doing the same things over and over that caused you to maybe be relieved of your duties. So uh, I guess I, uh, in a long way, uh, a long explanation, that would be my no quit. No, I think that's a, that's a really interesting story, and I appreciate you tying it back to, to when you were in, in college because obviously you've had a long coaching career. And I think to me, people often – I think have a disconnect with the word quitting and failure. And I think you're only a failure or you only quit if you completely stop. And I think to your perspective is you went from four years in your fourth year at Washington State and then you decide to step down, but it led you to so many other things. And I think what happens is people look at it differently and it's only quitting or failure, failing if you throw in the hat and say, I'm never going to do this again and I can't do it. But I think a lot of times what people have to do is they have to say, you know what, this is not the right place for me, or maybe I, I'm better off somewhere else. And I think Pat Riley's quote that you said about, you know, when you're when you're going to get fired, you just don't know when. I think, unfortunately, in, in the basketball world, it's so true, whether it's high school, college, professional, overseas, it's rare that a coach stays in the place for many, many, many years. And you and I could probably put together a very short list uh, in the NBA and college where it's been a long, long time. And, and those coaches and programs are extremely lucky, but – I, I really appreciate that. So here's a different question for you. If you had to define yourself, but you could only use one word, what would that word be? Q 
curious. And I say that immediately because that's kind of who I am and who I've been. And, um, uh, you know, curiosity lends itself to being a lifelong learner. And I think there's two types of people in this world. Uh, there's two types of players in the NBA. In all, there's two types of players in professional sports on, in all the different sports. There's two types of leaders. Uh, and, and that is the know-it-alls. And I don't think know-it-alls really ever progress. Uh, they may start fast, but they usually fizzle out. So uh, I choose to, to not live in the world of know-it-alls, and I choose to live in the world of learn-it-alls. Each and every day I wake up, and I've, been, I've kind of been sending this message to coaches for the last 30 years. Uh, be, be a learn-it-all. Uh, have a curious mind, because with the world changing as fast as it is right now, uh, the only way to keep up is to to uh, continue to to feed and put pour water into your uh, your knowledge pitcher that's inside your head and, and try and keep that filled as, as best we can and maybe even times where it, it, it'll be overflowing but that's okay too so I would say uh, curiosity no I, I like that and our listeners can't can't see what I see because they're not seeing it uh, via video but just audio but behind you, there are a bunch of books, and I was curious. One of the things that oh. we, we often talk about on each show is, and I learned this question from a mentor of mine, John C. Maxwell, is I wanted to ask you if you're reading anything currently or if you've read something recently that you'd like to recommend to our listeners. Well, there's so many to pick to pick one. I guess I should say why the best are the best, but, <laughs> but I'm not allowed to self-promote. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think one of the best books we can read that kind of keeps us centered is the, the four agreements by Dan Miguel Ruiz. Uh, it's a short book, but it makes you think, um, that's been a good one for those coaches who might be listening right now, especially younger coaches, uh, uh, win forever, uh, Pete Carroll's book. Uh, it talks about how to develop your own personal coaching philosophy and we can take that to any line of work really. What is our philosophy? Um, you know, there, there's so there's so many. I just happen to be looking at my Starbucks cup with the uh, that you can't see in the picture, but uh, there's a couple of books that uh, Howard Schultz has written that I think are really good uh, that that give us the story of, of um, uh, uh, how Starbucks became Starbucks. And then um, I, I have the good fortune uh, I'm going to meet this week with Ryan Holiday, who maybe many of your listeners know. Uh, because I'm going to be in Austin, Texas. And uh, The Obstacle is the Way is a, is a really good book uh, dealing with not quitting, right? There's going to be obstacles thrown in our way. Uh, so, uh, you know, and the meeting with Ryan Holiday jumps, kind of connects us to what we were talking about earlier, the curiosity. Uh, you know, he, he's so well known in his circle and, and his circle is wide. Uh, so I want to find out, you know, what makes Ryan Holiday Ryan Holiday? You know, I think it's interesting that you that you touch on that, and I appreciate you sharing some of those books. And and side notes, self self promotion is a hundred percent okay, and we'll touch on on your <laughs> book in uh, in a couple minutes because that's actually how how we connected. But I wanted to ask you a question. One of the things I've been studying for the past six months is the science behind a morning routine or the morning routine. And I was curious in your coaching days if a player or a coach. Um, you could share that had a really unique but also successful morning routine which led to their success? Well, all the great players, if your listeners uh, were to give me a list of um, who the great players are in the National Basketball Association, uh, all of them would have a routine. Uh, That's part of of the success plan for each and every one of these individuals. And uh, it, it it could be Kobe Bryant. Like if you ask Kobe, Kobe, what makes you Kobe? He would probably say for sure, at least one of his reasons would be 4.30 a.m. Because that's when he gets up to start his, especially in the off season, his uh, daily workout routine. So, uh, and in his line, uh, his line in regard to this is that gives me an opportunity to get one extra workout in per day than the, the other players in the league. So I can stay ahead. But, um, you know, for me personally, uh, I read two hours every single day, every single day. It, 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 I, I've not missed a day in probably 20 years. And even in coaching, I did that. 
and uh, it always started out with uh, uh, doing it first thing in the morning. And that may mean my morning has to start at 3.30 because I have such a packed day with, say, my coaching duties. Uh, but uh, every single day, you know, it's all about one of the words I, I mentioned in the book is the word intentional. And uh, routines are really the, the ultimate definition of intentional. What do we do each and every day intentionally to fulfill the goals we've set, to uh, uh, fulfill the dreams we've, we've put on ourselves that we've had since we were little kids? What do we do intentionally? And like I like to say with the word intentional, it's uh, what we do on purpose to fulfill our purpose. So what we do on purpose each day to fulfill the purpose we have in this world. Your purpose could be to be an assistant coach. Your purpose could be to, uh, to do great podcasts like yourself. Your purpose could be uh, to write a book. Uh, so what are you doing each day intentionally? That's your routine. Uh, working out is another part of my routine. Uh, finding think time each day, minimum 30 minutes uh, and, and preferably more where I just sit and think. Uh, those are all parts of the routine. Uh, Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, Kobe Bryant, Kevin Durant, they all have their certain times that they come in, in, in each day and get their lifting in, get their skill development in. So uh, if you want to be successful, if you want to be the best or your best, then routine has to be part of who you are and what you do and how you live. No, I appreciate your sh sharing that. And, and ironically, I picked up your book and Kobe's new book in the in the same week, and I I blew through both of them in, in uh, probably a day or two. And and I'm a voracious reader myself, and I think it's so important to put things in your mind, put things in front of your eyes. And in today's day and age with technology, there's so many amazing videos and things out there as well. And I think Kobe, as you said, hit it best is he talks about in his book how he was working out before people were even awake, and he was notorious for sometimes 12 o'clock and 1 a.m. workouts because he knew that his schedule where there's traveling to and from. And and obviously, uh, you know, you had some some interaction. So I wanted to actually touch on something. The word failure is a word that I think people don't truly understand. And I wanted to ask maybe what role has failure played in your professional career as a coach? Well, in coaching, especially in the NBA, uh, it, it's a very uh, humbling business. Uh, when you think you know it all, you get humbled the next night because every team is good. Every player is good. It's just some are, are better than others. But I, like I often say, even the bad players in the NBA are really good. They just don't look that way relative to the others. So failure to me, um, kind of like I was talking about earlier, you can treat it one of two ways. You can treat it as devastation or you can treat it as education. And I think those people who are successful uh, treat it as education. They understand it's going to sting. It's going to embarrass us maybe. Uh, it, it's going to put us in a down mode uh, for a, a period of time maybe. Uh, but we have to learn from it. You know, uh, I often say you have to learn from the past, not live in the past. And, and, and by that I mean success or failure. Uh, just learn from, from why each occurrence happened and then uh, put, a, put kind of a plan together so it won't happen again or you will make sure it continues to happen because you were successful. The other thing I think failure does is uh, it can stop us or it can start us. And with the best of the best, it starts us. It challenges us. And then the last thing I'll throw at you in regard to failure, um, and I talk about it in, in, in the book, is um, so many people are afraid to fail. They're, they're embarrassed about that consequence of failure. So I often say this, if, if you fear that consequence of failure, please do yourself a favor. Put equal fear to the consequence of never trying. Because what happens if it works? So I'm a prime example of that. I, I, I was scared to death to go into the NBA. Because it's a different world. Everyone wants to coach Hall of Fame players, which I've had an opportunity to coach. Everyone wants to coach all-star players, which I've had an opportunity to coach. But guess what? They put Hall of Fame demands on your knowledge. They put Hall of Fame demands on your teaching. So I wasn't sure, you know, was I good enough? Uh, so, but I went into it saying, okay, uh, I'm, 
I'm going to fear this consequence of never trying more so than just fearing the consequence of, of failure. So I ended up doing that. My gosh, you know, uh, I, winning a world championship in 2008, coaching in two all-star games, coaching Hall of, Fla- uh, Hall of Fame players, coaching all-stars, um, just had an incredible uh, experience, uh, all because I wasn't going to let failure stop me before I started. No, I, I love that. And that's something that I often talk about is if you try anything, only one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to succeed or you're not going to succeed. But going back to what you said about about learning is is I heard a famous quote, and I think it's been quoted or I think five or six different people have been have been credited with it. But it's I never lose. Either I win or I learn. And I love yeah. that. I love that quote because. Of course, everybody wants to win every game, and you being a former coach would have been great if you went every season 82-0 in the regular season and won every game. But the reality is even like teams like the Golden State Warriors, they don't win every single game. But the question is what happens, and I, and I love how you, how you broke that down because I think it's so, it's so simplistic when you think about it as far as conceptually, but then again, you have to put in the time, and you can either learn or you can let it you know kill you you can let it you know paralyze you and a lot of times people just stop completely so i i love the all those different analogies analogies you made before we jump into your book wanted to ask you one i guess different question for you is if you could go back and give the 20 year old version of yourself one piece of advice now assuming the 20 year old version would have listened what would that advice have been don't don't take everything so personally you know, uh, sometimes you're a part of success and a part of failure. And, and more importantly, I'm talking about failure. Uh, I didn't, I, I took it so personal that it became, I became so competitive. And one of the reasons I got out of coaching at the college level is I did not like the person I was becoming uh, because uh, I took it so personal that probably uh, that bled into uh, more negativity coming out, out of my mouth than positivity. And I think with a college-age athlete, uh, you have to mix the two, but it has to be far more uh, positivity than negativity. So uh, that would be number one. I would have read more when I was younger because the reason I'm, I'm reading all the time now is I got to catch up to all you guys. I got to. You've read so many more books than I have. So uh, my challenge is to try and catch up with all of your listeners in terms of the the number of books, articles, blogs, etc. That I read. So probably those things are, are what jump out first. No, I I, uh, I think it's uh, it's definitely a challenge. I, I too have to have to keep up with everything that's out there, and it's a twenty four hour job if uh, if you really want to keep up with everybody, all the books and all the blogs and all the websites. So here's a different question for you: If you could have dinner with anybody, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Uh, <clears throat> I guess. Those who are alive, uh, I'm fascinated by Oprah Winfrey because I think some people have knowledge, others have wisdom. I think she falls into the latter. Uh, I'm very curious about what made Barack Obama Barack Obama. Um, so, so those two who are living, in terms of those who have passed, uh, maybe, maybe a guy like Steve Jobs, because I thought his genius was in simplifying things and how did his mind work to take it from, uh, what was probably something elaborate in their very first meeting down to something so simplistic that, uh, it was genius. Um, so I guess those jump out, uh, first and foremost, and then probably in the, in the sports world, uh, it might be a guy like a, a, a Peyton Manning, uh, a Tom Brady, uh, a Tony Dungy, who took a totally different approach to coaching in the NFL than many others. So, uh, yeah, to tell you the truth, I, I'd sit down to eat dinner with anyone because you can learn what to do or not or what not to do from everyone. You know the name Jay Billis. Yep, he, he was on the show. Yeah. Okay. So Jay, Jay probably said, uh, this, um, you know, everybody you meet knows something that you don't. And I've never forgotten that. Uh, uh, Jay said that to me a long, long time ago. Uh, now you can tell Jay, that's one of the only things I've remembered that he told me. (laughs) 
I, I definitely won't tell him that. He, uh, he probably would get mad at me for saying that. Okay, then I'll text him this morning and tell him. <laughs> um, so question for you. I just read your book, and again, that's how we connected. And I love the titles, Why the Best are the Best. And I guess the subtitle is 25 Powerful Words that Impact, Inspire, and Define Champions. And before I read this book, I, I received it in uh, from Amazon. And when I was looking at it, I looked at those 25 words. And I know you and I briefly spoke about this before we went live. But, but two of those words are action and accountability. And for me... A lot of the stuff we, we have with No Quit Living is hashtag accountability. So I wanted to just, just ask you a couple of questions. But the first question is, so many people think about want to want to write a book at some point. What was in your mind and what ultimately led you from thinking about wanting to actually going ahead and writing that first book? Well, um, part of it, there, there are different parts. Part of it was I get so many emails uh, each week and, and throughout the year asking specific questions about uh, my journey or, or my climb, uh, about coaching, about success, about leadership. So um, I decided that uh, I was going, I, there's four books that I want to do. This was the first one. And um, so, uh, you know, I probably wrote it in my head for 20 years. And then the actual writing of it didn't probably take as long as people think because I had been writing it in my head. Um, but I also wanted to give someone an opportunity because not everybody can come hear you speak. Not everybody can be side by side with you at each and every day. So this gave people an opportunity, uh, maybe in a more frugal way, to uh, see somebody else's journey uh, that uh, it probably was just like them. I had no coaching tree. I was a little shy, introverted when I was a younger person. Uh, so how did I overcome these things and, and get to where I, I, I've gotten to? And then the other thing is to share some stories of some of the best of the best. And it's not that they, I don't need the reader to relate to those people. That's not what it's about. It's not whether we can relate to the people in the book. It's can we learn from them? Because when they started, they were just like us. They had no history. They, they didn't know what they were going to become just yet. So um, there's so many lessons I've learned from being around the best. But I do have to tell your listeners, there, there's two bests. Uh, there's the best, and that's a daunting task for many, many people. Like, I can't become the best at what I do. I, so, so we get paralyzed. Well, there's the other best, which is, is really what the book was written for. And that's to become our best, to become my best. And I think uh, that was that was why I, I ended up writing the book. You know, I I love that you just said that because I think it's it's so simple. And I don't want in any way, shape, or form to say that your book is simple, but the concept is simple: is being the best at anything. And you, we used a couple people, for example, Kobe Bryant, to be the best, Michael Jordan, LeBron James. To be the best is, is very, very difficult, and we all can't be the best at one thing. But what every single person that's listening to this show today can do today, tomorrow, tonight, is they can become and they can work on becoming their best and the best versions of themselves. And, and I absolutely love that fact that you just said that because I think it talks about your book. And like you said, people love to learn from stories, and you don't need to be able to say, well, I was – just as good as a basketball player as Kevin Garnett or I was just as good as a coach as Doc Rivers. There could be somebody that coaches his or her son or daughter's third grade team that's listening to this show and the reality is at practice tonight or a game tomorrow they should aim to just be the best version of themselves and to get better and and I that's what I love about sports and I before we went live you and I briefly spoke but I think sports world is just it overlaps into all different areas which is why you've had some very successful speaking engagements in the real world, and you mentioned some of those in your books. I want to take a a spin back to one of our words. So, the word accountability, as we said, is is huge in, in our vocabulary at No Quit Living. And I was curious if I could just ask you what the word accountability means to you. To me, accountability means owning up to your uh, mistakes, failures, words, and actions, uh, in its simplest form. So, but as I often talk about, that, that, that's, that's not the only ability that we need to master. Uh, 
and I know your listeners will say, well, I've never heard that word ability. And uh, uh, that's not in the dictionary. And as I always say to that retort is, uh, well, I, you know, I don't know Marion Webster. Maybe your listeners do, but uh, <laughs> why does he or she get to pick all the words? So in my book of success, ability is a word. And that you have to master a number of abilities, accountability for sure. But what if, what if everyone on your team or everyone in your company mastered the art of accountability? What if they mastered responsibility? What if they mastered dependability? What if they mastered adaptability? You know, uh, obviously, what if they mastered in the corporate world profitability? But you get, you get, you get my gist. Uh, it's not the only ability out there that's important and an integral part of, of becoming successful. No, I, I could not agree more. And I think it's it's amazing how you tied that that into who gets to choose which words go in or not. But I think it's amazing because the reality is whether we have a dictionary or not, you get to choose what words go in and out of your mouth each and every day. So I want to talk to you and just get your perspective for a minute on one thing you wrote in the book in the chapter titled Commitment. And I love how you talk about when you ask players what time zones they're in. And I think you had a good message about that. But you broke down spare time, part time, full time and all the time. I was wondering if you could just briefly touch on that for a minute. Yeah, I I, I think, you know, the, the gist of all that is some people kind of do it when they want to do it, when it's convenient for them. And um, uh, Jerry West, the great NBA player. Uh, I was sitting with him in Hawaii, actually, at our, at our training camp uh, when I was with the Clippers. And um, he said, you know, the best players and the most successful people of all the people he's met in and out of sports, uh, they work hard on the days they feel like not working hard. You can't just pick and choose what time you want to, to work. So, um, you know, ultimately it gets down to, to, to doing it all the time. And uh, you can't just do it when you want to do it. You can't just do it when it's convenient for you. You can't just do it when someone makes you do it. It has to be a, an internal drive uh, because you have to make it – with everything you want to do in life, you have to make a decision. Are you just going to be interested in doing it or are you going to be committed to doing it? The interested people are usually fall into the category of average. They do a little bit more than those who are below average, and they have a little bit of an interest in it. And it's okay if, if, if that's all the level in, in one particular part of your life that you want to take something to. I mean, that's your choice. Uh, but I think if you really want to be good, you have to figure out, okay, let's say for anyone listening, what dreams do I have? How, how high are my dreams and my goals? So let's say you can maybe see this on, you can see it where I'm raising my hand above my head. There are, that's where my dreams and goals are. But let's say my work ethic is way down here, maybe a foot below those, all right, with my hands spread apart. Well, if my work ethic and my habits don't match my dreams and my goals, I'll never get there. So there's a gap there. And that gap is often filled with regret and excuses. And people who live in the world of regret, people who live in the world of blame, people who live in the world of excuses, they never get to where they want to go. So they're going to be frustrated their entire life. So, so I would say just evaluate what time zone you work in. Uh, not so much uh, uh, Eastern Standard Time or Pacific Standard Time, but uh, the spare time, the part time, the all the time, those types of time zones. That's awesome. So before we let you go, Kevin, I wanted to ask you just a couple of questions, but the question for me is important. If you have any parting words you'd like to leave with our listeners. Uh, I, I guess it's something that I, that, that kind of spurs me each and every day. And it's kind of a little personal philosophy. And it, and it goes like this. There's more inside each of us. There truly is more inside each of us. So our jobs each and every day is to figure out how to pull that out. Uh, and that's another reason why I ended up writing the book, to try and give examples of how others pulled it out of themselves. We've talked a lot about the concept of words today. And words are great, but they're, they're incredible. They're way, way, way above great if you do this. Some people have words in their vocabulary 
other people live those words. So whatever your words are, you got to live them, not just say them and have them in your vocabulary. No, I think that's that's great advice. And then for our listeners that would like to connect with you or follow you, or for our listeners that would like to to pick up a copy of your book, as I highly recommend that, what's the best way for them to do so? Well, a lot of things. Number one, I, I have a Twitter where I, I just do quick hit bullets on success, leadership, de- uh, career development, etc. So they can go at Kevin Eastman. The website is kevineastman.net. And uh, on the website, you can see there's a there's a link where you can click to, 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 to look at the book or order the book, uh, whichever. But I only want people to order it if they feel that it might be able to help them maybe inch closer to where they want to go. So those would be the, I guess, the two. Uh, and then there's my newsletter and blog are also on the website. So it's kevineastman.net. Awesome. And then are you also on Instagram as well? Yes, I am. Uh, but you're asking someone who is a little behind the curve, and I'm not afraid to uh, say that. That's part of my growth for this year. Uh, my wife, Wendy, who does a lot with our company, uh, is always getting on me uh, about trying to keep up. Well, now not just keep up, but uh, could you even get close to what everybody else is doing? Uh, so <laughs> so I, I hear it each and every day. But it's but that's good because I think everybody in their life, they, they need a truth teller. And um, uh, Wendy, uh, my wife, is, is one of them as well. Um, and then, you know, you can also look up, I guess, Kevin Eastman speaking. Uh, and then you can, uh, you know, if, if, if for some reason somebody out there uh, likes what they heard. And, you know, I speak to corporate teams, sports teams, uh, C-C- C-suite level people, leadership teams. Uh, and the fun part about that, as you know, because you speak as well, we get to find out and enter the other people's worlds. You know, we've only lived in our world our entire lives. So I enjoy sharing my world with others about why we won a championship and how to get the most out of your people. But I also enjoy learning about how the corporate world, what their strategies are to do the exact same. No, that's, that's so important. I, I love doing that as well. And I just spoke this past week at a real estate convention. And for me, it's definitely stepping out of my comfort zone, but more importantly, it's learning about other people and why they're successful. So listen, Kevin, I truly, truly appreciate your time today. And I look forward to hopefully staying in touch with you. And thank you again for being a guest on the show. Sounds good, Chris. Good luck with everything you're doing. Thank you for listening to episode number 165. Kevin Eastman is quite an individual that is all about paying it forward to and from others. He described himself as curious, and I couldn't agree more. As a lifelong learner, Kevin shared how even during his intense and extremely grueling NBA career that he has for the past 20 years read for at least two hours every single day. Which reminds me of a famous Charles Jones quote where he says, readers are leaders. As failure is a topic we often discuss, Kevin shared some key points with us. He mentioned how we can either look at failure as devastation or education, how failure can either stop us or it can start us. When it came to the topic of fear, Kevin discussed how we should not just look at the fear of failure, but we should also examine the fear of not even trying. One thing Kevin touched upon was the idea of being the best at something. He mentioned how we might not all be able to be the absolute best in our field or endeavor, but we all have the opportunity of being our best, being my best and being your best. So in conclusion, where do you stand today? Where do you fall in your company, on your team, or within your organization? Do you put in your obligatory eight hour days and coast through the motions, or do you really and truly push yourself? Do you strive to be your absolute best? Or perhaps do you do just enough every single day to get by? As we head into the last two months of 2018, I challenge you today to do more, to be more, and to strive for more. Don't do it just because, or for someone else and their expectations. Instead, do it for you and you only. A famous quote from George Hallis comes to mind where he says, nobody who ever gave his best regretted it. Don't live your life with regret. Push forward, keep going, strive to be your very best, and go for your greatness. And lastly, to our listeners, thank you. 
We truly appreciate your time, and we hope our episodes inspire you to keep on attacking life and never giving up. To quote Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, it's always too early to quit.